you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. I want to say before we get started that uh, yesterday our motorcycle group uh, went up to Queen Mil- Wilhelmina Lodge. <laughs> I almost got it. We went through Worcester and come over the mountain and we stopped about halfway. And I, we were standing there just visiting. And, uh, you know, I looked out across the mountain and you see the colors, and you see the trees, you see that. And my question to the guys was, how could somebody say there wasn't a God? Folks, I'm telling you, God's in everything. If you will look, even in the bad stuff, He has a purpose. He has a reason. And I am telling you, we rode 192 miles yesterday, and uh, we had a blast. Uh, Got to eat lunch, and I will say, I cheated like a dog yesterday, all right? I've lost 14 pounds in five weeks, and I said, I'm eating a buffet today, all right? So I'll get right back on it. I'll get right back on it today. Uh, So confession is good for the soul, folks, all right? Amen. Jesus' baptism. Let's talk about Jesus' baptism. And Uh, The outline, if you want to follow with us, is in your bulletin. Number one, the baptism of the Son. The baptism of the Son. And by the way, it is clearly seen. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all right, is clearly seen here and in other places also, all right? So we see the baptism of the Son, the anointing of the Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit, and the affirmation of the Father. The affirmation of the Father. The Bible says, or or excuse me, we have now come to the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. This wonderful event will bring into focus what Jesus' ministry was all about. The Lord Jesus Christ comes onto the stage of the full gospel story after an eternity of uh, of glory in heaven and 30 years on earth, Jesus was about to fulfill his purpose for coming to earth, and it was to be crucified on a cross and to pay for our sins. It is truly the gospel story. John the Baptist had faithfully prepared the way for King Jesus. It was going to be uh, an honor and a privilege for him to baptize Jesus. I cannot imagine what that would have been like. To have been there that day would have been incredible. Here we also clearly see the Trinity. So let's look at this exciting scripture together. Matthew 3, and we'll start in verse 13. The baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John. And specifically, he came from Nazareth. We knew that was where he was. And there is no indication that anybody was with him. We know the disciples weren't with him because they hadn't been called yet. So uh, the indication was he came seeking John the Baptist for this special reason, and that is to be baptized. And it says from Galilee uh, to John at the Jordan. And by the way, most writers think it was at uh, the Jordan where Bethany was, somewhere in that location there, to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? John, again, I, I like, when, I, when I read through the Bible, I like to put myself in their place. Okay, you will personalize in it will really help you understand the text also. So if I lived in that time and I was, you know, from the backwoods, when you looked at me and says, that dude's scary. All right. Wild hair. I mean, camel's hair on too. You know, you, you just would not think. And that's what I love about God. He doesn't pick the obvious all the time. All right, John the Baptist was probably not the most polished guy that that Jesus knew, but he knew what uh, he was doing. He knew what John the Baptist was doing, and he realized that God had told him, this is what you need to do. Well, why would John say, 
uh, you know, why would he say, prevent him? I need to be baptized, you, and you are coming to me. The question there, well, the deal is, what is baptism for? It's for repentance of sin. It is for confession of sin, all right? It is giving your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And what he is saying was, I am a sinner. I need to repent. I need this. I qualify for baptism. But folks, Jesus never did anything wrong. He was the perfect Lamb of God. So John was simply saying, man, I don't get this. You of all people don't need to be baptized. Why? Because you came from heaven. Why? Because you're perfect. Why? Because I'm unworthy. You can see in other scriptures that we're going to look at, he's just saying, you know, you could find somebody better than I to baptize you. So he was almost puzzled with that. All right? And it says, but Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now. I love all the Gospels, and if you've seen the Gospels, you remember Mary at the first miracle that Jesus did. He turned water into wine. And you remember what he said to the helpers and those that were servants. Whatever Jesus says to do, do it. Folks, that is wise, wise. That is wisdom there. Folks, if we would do that in our personal lives, when Jesus tells you to do something, it, you would do it, then you would be much, much better off. So John was unworthy. John was backing up. John was saying, man, you, you got the wrong guy just about. But Jesus said, not only do I want you to do it, I want you to do it now. All right? For thus, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. We can look at the book of John. Hold your finger there to a John, the Gospel of John 1. John 1. And look down in verse 24. The voice cried in the wilderness is John the Baptist. And verse 24 says, Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ or Elijah nor the prophet? We spoke about this last week. And John answered them and said, I baptize with water, but there is one. Notice the, the one, the O is capitalized, which is saying deity. All right? He's saying there is the one among you whom you do not know. And that's why John the Baptist wouldn't baptize the scribes and the Pharisees. They thought the Messiah had, hadn't come. They would not acknowledge who Jesus is. And folks, if you don't believe, you are not a candidate for baptism just by what the Word says. And it's not a thing of inclusion, you know, exclusion. It's a thing of we're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to do what Jesus says and did. Verse 27, and it is he who coming after me is preferred before me whose sandal straps I'm not worthy to lose. So he was simply, and I don't think he was trying to be humble. He was humble. He knew who Jesus was. Why? Because he was only six months older than him. So uh, Mary and Elizabeth, you, you know, all that was going on. They're, they're mothers, and, and they probably were around each other when they were younger, in the teenage years and in the early 20s. So he knew who Jesus was and what he was about. And he's simply saying, hey, I'm a sinner. I need to confess. I need to repent. I need to be baptized, but not Jesus. I, I can't even carry his shoes. Folks, that's what a slave would do. That's what a slave in those do, days would do. So you see this going on. Verse 28, and these things were done in uh, Bethabarba, which is Bethany, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Then the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, folks, he was telling everybody that was at this baptism. See, uh, John the Baptist was baptizing hundreds. All right, he had huge crowds following him. And when Jesus came, 
He wanted everyone to know this is the Son of God. This is the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah. And it says, this, he, uh, uh, this is he whom I said, after me comes a man, capital M, deity, who is preferred before me, for he was before me. You say, now wait a minute, I thought John was older than Jesus. What's he talking about? His eternity. Listen to me, folks. Jesus always was. God always was. Nobody created God in Jesus. They always was. And matter of fact, we'll see here in just a few minutes, Jesus uh, was in creation. Acts 2. This went on to the church, okay, to the, to the New Testament church. When the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came down, all right, and, and Peter preached and 3,000 souls got saved. Look at verse 38, Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins. And again, for means because of, because you are a sinner and you sh shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Folks, I am telling you, when you are truly saved, at that point of confession and repentance. And by the way, folks, Jesus said to repent. John the Baptist said to repent. And Peter just said to repent. So to be saved, you better repent. Okay? It's not just believing in a God. It is repenting. And your life needs to change. So he's just simply saying there, you know, uh, you know uh, as far as the ministry and as far as he's saying... You must, you, you need to be baptized, you, the, the water baptism, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. So I jotted down four reasons why I believe Jesus was baptized. Number one, it was the will of God and obedience to the Father. God told him to, I believe God through the Holy Spirit told him to be baptized, and Scripture just confirms it. So, it was the will of God. Number two, it was an example for others. And it was important for John's and Jesus' ministry. Okay? The baptism, following the Lord in baptism, repenting of your sins, and confessing Jesus publicly. The third thing, it was an identification with new believers. And later on, the New Testament church, which I just showed you. And the fourth thing it was the perfect illustration of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus had a purpose in being baptized. He was probably by himself. But I'm telling you, when John announced that, I, I, I know there was just a rumble in the place and just saying, this is the Messiah, this is Jesus. And so he baptized, he confirmed John's ministry also, I believe. So we see the baptism of the Son. Number two, the anointing of the Spirit. Look at verse 16. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. That's why, folks, we don't sprinkle because the Bible doesn't tell us to sprinkle. He said he went down into the Jordan. He went down into the water. So to be in the water, you got to come up out of the water. All right? That's what immersion is. That's what immersion means. And behold, the heavens were open to him. Boy, I, I would have loved to have been there that day. Can you imagine seeing the heavens open? I don't know about you, but every once in a while, God gives us those aha moments Okay, one, it, it's been a while, but I was coming to work and it was kind of a cloudy day. And I get about where the, you know, where the light is. I just come over the hill and I look up and there's this light. It looked like it was shining down to he in heaven right over our cross in our lighthouse. And I looked at that, you know, this is about eight o'clock in the morning. And I thought, I thought, my goodness, God, thank you for showing out today. Thank you, folks. The heavens 
opened up the day Jesus was baptized. And, and the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and, and, and alighting upon him. Man, you talk about a spiritual moment. You talk about one of those, if you were able to witness that. And again, I'm praying that God has this huge screen up there. And I'm praying he's got it all on video or on DVD. And we're going to see that. You know, we're, we're going to see that. Can you imagine the crossing of the Red Sea when that water came back? All right. Can you imagine some of the things on Mount Transfiguration? Okay. All these things I'm hoping we get to see. You say, well, that's silly. Well, folks, God can do anything. All right. I'm just putting in a little request to God early, and you will thank me later, okay? It was amazing. It was incredible. That had never taken place. Have you noticed Jesus does a lot of things first? There had never been a virgin birth. Never. There has not been one since. Okay, and I'll explain that in just a few minutes. So this came up. And folks, what baptism is, it's an outward sign of an inward change. All right, you need to be saved. You need to have asked for forgiveness of your sins and invited Jesus Christ into your life to be a candidate for baptism. Romans chapter 6 Go with me to Romans 6. The Bible says in Romans 6, What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? And Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he is simply saying, you know, don't be a disgrace to grace. I've heard a few people just say, you know, well, I'm going to do this, and God's going to forgive me anyway. Ooh, I wouldn't take that approach, folks. You are not smart to do that. Don't be a disgrace to grace. It doesn't give you a license to do whatever you want to do. We do what the Bible says, okay? And folks, sometimes I really think we confuse lost people, people that don't know Christ. Oh, I heard this said one time, and I'm telling you, I could not believe what I heard. Somebody did something and a lost person said, I thought you were a Christian. Ouch. Man, I'm telling you, I don't believe I had to say anything after that. Okay? Folks, I'm telling you, the world is looking at us. They are looking at our lives. They are looking at our language. They are looking at where we go and what we do. We don't do it for ourselves or for them we do it for Him. That's why we are the way we are. That's why a life needs to change. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? I love this. Certainly not. If you've got a King James, straight King James Bible, it says, God forbid. We don't need to be sinning. How shall we, who died to sin, live any longer therein? See, there was a death. There was a death when you got saved. He said, uh, I never passed out. I never died. Oh, folks, you died to self. Before I got saved, I did what I wanted to do. I went where I wanted to go. I said what I wanted to say, and I acted like I wanted to act. But folks, when you get saved, you die to self. That's why I keep telling you, folks, one phrase will help you if you will memorize this phrase, and it is not hard. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Died to sin. Live any longer then. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, uh, Jesus, we were baptized into his death. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And we died to self at the point of salvation. 
Then it says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. When someone dies, all right, what do you do? You put them under, you bury them in the ground, in the ground. You put them in the ground. Therefore, they were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should uh, also we should walk in the newness of life. And that's the picture of baptism. You've seen us baptized. I mean, if you've been here long, hundreds of people. And that's that's what baptism is. It is a picture of this is Mike. The old Mike, he died. I don't want to do what I used to do. I don't want to go where I used to go. I don't want to say what I used to say. No, we're not perfect. I understand that. But folks, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So, hey, we walk into the water. We're standing there. We are buried with Christ in baptism, and we are raised to walk in the newness of life. What is newness? A new beginning. Oh, folks, I hope you have read your Bible in Psalms that says, when you get saved, your sin is erased as far as it is from the east unto the west. I'm telling you, I mean, if this whole front was was a white board, I really didn't get saved till I was 22 years old. I mean, my sin, you couldn't get it all on the, <laughs> on the board up here. And we're forgiven of that. Amen. And by the way, in Acts 2.38, they says, repent and be baptized. I twice got dunked, is what? Twice I just got wet because I'd, I made two false professions of faith. But I'm telling you, when I was 22... And I truly gave my heart and life to Christ when I was truly changed. That baptism was different than the other two. That's different. And it says, verse 5, For we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly we will also, also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. The newness of life. Folks, Jesus died on the cross But three days later, he arose. Death could not hold our Savior. It couldn't. And we are the same way, folks. Because he died for us, we do not have to die the second death. Matter of fact, I'll be honest with you, folks. You look at all that's going on in Israel. You look at what this world is coming to. I believe with all my heart, Jesus, and I'm not predicting something. This is what my heart and my bones, when both of them say it, I'm just telling you, I believe Jesus could come before this year is out. I believe that. It's all lining up. And you watch the Word. You watch it. The closer it gets to it, the faster things are going. See, we always think a top, the world is a top, and you know, you, and you go, and folks, the world is exactly the opposite. It starts slow. And I'm telling you, it is on warp speed right now. Sin is everywhere you look. So we need to be ready. We need to be ready. John 1. Look at John 1 with me, if you would. John 1. Verse 32, John 1, 32, the Bible says, And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said unto me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And folks, we get nervous as Baptists when we say something, hey, he got the anointing. Folks, I am telling you, for us, it comes at the point of salvation. There's not a second blessing. People are looking and seeking a second blessing. You got all you're going to get that first time. 
Now, a manifestation of the Spirit is different than anointing. What did he anoint Jesus for? To raise the dead. Why? To heal the people. To prove deity in his life. Jesus was doing things nobody other than Old Testament prophets had done. It had been quiet from Old Testament to New Testament for 400 years. And when Jesus came on the scene and he started those miracles, I'm telling you, it got everybody's attention. And even he passed it along, folks. I know this makes a lot of people nervous, but the disciples, Peter and John, going by the temple, guy says, hey, man, give me some money. We need some money. Silver and gold have I none. But in the name of Jesus Christ, you rise up and you walk. That was a special anointing, I believe, for the disciples in the ministry that they were going to do after Jesus left. So Peter, you know, brought, brought uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, back, back from life. Somebody help me here. Well, not Lazarus, the, somebody's mother. Yes, yeah, thank you. Who said that? Give him. (laughs) You got a good name, Jonathan. You got a good name. (laughs) Folks, Jesus was unlike any person ever. He was the true son of God. Then the last thing, the affirmation of the father. Look at verse 17. Verse 17. Well, let me get there and we'll look at it. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, now remember the first thing, it was Jesus. He was in the water. He was in the water. That's Jesus. The spirit of God was in the form of a dove. And now a voice came from heaven. Well, who was it? It was Michael. No, it wasn't. It was God. God says from heaven, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. Oh, folks. This is another thing we need to do. We need to please the heavenly Father. We need to act like Jesus. We need to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? But we need to please the heavenly Father. It was affirmation. It was verbal confirmation. It was God saying, Son, I am so proud of you. It was uh, a, a deep and personal, uh, uh, you know, word from his father. So we see, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. Colossians 1. Colossians 1. Go with me there. Now I'm fixing to get fired up here, okay? I'm just giving you a warning, all right? When I read this scripture here, This says it all about who Jesus is. Folks, there's only one way to heaven. Only one way. It's Jesus Christ. You can work at it. You can change it. You can read some other book. You can read a different Bible. But I'm telling you, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus doesn't lie. God doesn't lie. God's perfect. Jesus is perfect. And here in Colossians, he is the image, talking about Jesus, of the invisible God. What is an image? Jesus even said, when you have seen me, you have seen God. Well, that sounds a little boastful. No, it is the truth. You're not bragging if it's truth. You guys who lie about how great you were when you was an athlete, that ain't the truth, okay? But we're telling the truth. God is saying, and Jesus is saying, when you see me, you see God. I still get blown away. I would have loved to live in Jesus' days. I mean, I know it'd been hard, you know, no, no refrigerators, you know, no remote controls, all right? No, none of your gadgets, But just to see Jesus on earth, in the flesh, and watch him would have been amazing. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
It doesn't mean he was created first. I told you earlier, Jesus wasn't created. He is saying the firstborn is the absolute most important birth on earth. On earth. For by him, all things were created. Read John chapter 1, okay? It talks about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And Jesus was in creation that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and and, and invisible. Okay? I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to serve a God that I can't see. Well, folks, I shared with you earlier, I see God everywhere. If you will look, He is everywhere. The invisible and the visible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers... There is no king on this earth greater than our king, Jesus. God is in control of this. I got news for you. Little rocket man in Korea, he's not running this deal, all right? It is God, and he will eventually do exactly what God tells him to do. All things were created through him and for him. That's exclusive, all, everything. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. He's keeping it going too. He's sustaining it. The breath you are breathing right now comes from God and Jesus. If you woke up today, you need to thank God that you woke up today. Verse 18, and he's the head of the body. Folks, this is not my church. I hope you understand that. It's not. It's God's church. Yes, I am the pastor. Yes, I am the shepherd. But I am telling you, this is God's church. And this is the reason we're growing. Because we are letting God be God, Jesus be Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is here. We've got to do that. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have preeminence. Preeminence is only used right here in the Word of God. And I wrote down three words. Absolute, supreme authority. God and Jesus are in control. And folks, the sooner you come under his authority, the better off you're going to be. Because I believe one day, Soon, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great shepherd, the bread of life, the alpha and the omega, the living water will come, and he is coming soon for you and I. We need to understand that. So today, the question simply is, number one, are you Have you been scripturally baptized? Have you been baptized the way God says to do it? Number two, do you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? You need to make a profession of faith first, and then you can be scripturally baptized. And then for the Christian is, do you need to rededicate your life to Christ? And then the last is, maybe God is speaking to you. Maybe he's speaking to you right now, and he's saying, you know what? I think it's real plain what's going on at Rye Hill Baptist Church. God's here. We're going to preach the word. We're not changing for anyone. And I am not kidding this, folks. If they start trying to censor me, y'all need to get money together. Don, where's Don? Where's Don Crook at? Is he, is he here? Oh, there he is over there. Don, we need a new fund. Okay? Pastor out of jail fund. Okay? I will not shut up. I will not back up until we let the whole world know you can't tell us what to say. I have a right. I have the First Amendment right also. So, folks, you do what God tells you to do. Father, thank you for this day. And God... I just thank you for sending your son. God, we, we aren't really worth it. But God, you see us how we are. And God, you forgive us. 
and you love us. And God, I thank you so much for that. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. And God, I pray you would speak to hearts today. God, there are people here that need Jesus. They need Jesus. There are others that just need to be scripturally baptized. And God, I pray for those who need to rededicate their life. God, we need to stand up and we need to stand out for you. So God, would you just work on our hearts? God, thank you. Thank you for salvation. And thank you for scriptural baptism. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?